So hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, you know, the, the inclusion and access panel at the City Tech Science Fiction Symposium. I'm so happy to be here moderating. My name is Joy Sanchez Taylor. Uh, for those people who don't know me, I am uh, a professor of English at LaGuardia Community College, which is a CUNY school. And my book, Diverse Futures, came out this year. I'm very happy about it uh, and hope you guys will all check it out. And we have four amazing speakers for you guys today. I'm going to introduce them and do an abbreviated uh, bio for each one so that we can get right to, down to the talks. We'll go in the order uh, that's on the program. So first presenting will be Lee Gold. She's presenting Confronting Language in the Science Fiction Text, Language Access and Trauma in Octavia Butler and Ursula K. Le Guin. Uh, Lee is a scholar of German literature and her current research includes science fiction's role in the classroom, research on Ursula K. Le Guin and connections between dance, literature and philosophy. Uh, next up is Catherine Pratt, who will be talking, uh, giving a talk Shipping Supergirl, Discovering and Defending Lesbian Identity Through a DC Fandom. Catherine is a librarian at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, and she holds an MFA in addition to her library degree and is writing a novel set in occupied New York during the Revolutionary War. Very interesting. Uh, after is Sean Scanlon. He'll be presenting Cool Access and Access to Cool, Gibson's Gun Mall, Dorothea Benedetti, uh, Sean is an associate professor of English at New York City College of Technology. So many CUNY schools, I love it. He published Global Homesickness in William Gibson's Blue Ant Trilogy for the collection, The City After 9-11, Literature, Film, and Television. And he is the founder and editor of Nano New American Notes Online. And then last but not least, Ida Yoshinaga uh, is presenting corporate employment practices towards greater diversity of story development for science fiction fantasy screen stories. Ida is an assistant professor of science fiction film at the Georgia Institute of Technology, and her screen studies research centers on the production relations between creative labor from racial, gender, and class minority groups and majority dominated management within corporate transmedia. So welcome all of you, really amazing. Uh, amazing bios and amazing uh, uh, presentation titles. And we're just gonna take it away with Lee and let the presentation start. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm so sorry again for, for being late and for my confusion. So appreciate it. I also realized that I should have updated my bio a little bit, but I will say that I'm an adjunct professor at City Tech um, as well as BMCC. And I am really excited to be here and participating today. So thank you so much. Uh, I hate disclaimers, but I will also just say that, um, that this is a, quite a preliminary um, exploration. So um, I'd love you know, to hear from people. And, and so it's really just the beginning. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna get started. Um, <clears throat> language is something that can befall us, writes the sometimes love and sometimes loved and sometimes hated Martin Heidegger in his famous text on language entitled On the Way to Language. This is especially the case when language trips us up, makes us falter, when we cannot find the words to communicate. It is in those moments, Heidegger argues, that we must confront what language even is. As Ursula K. Le Guin discusses, and as many writers inevitably must consider, it is language that allows us to create realities, that allows us to imagine or establish worlds, and that enables us to identify ourselves. Through naming, we try to get at something's essence, though this too is often lacking or results in an imperfect match. When we are without language completely, without the ability to communicate with others, what are we missing? What happens to those who cannot use language as a means to express their own identity, goals, desires, histories, traumas? What happens to language when the weight of trauma or suffering is at stake? And what happens when we cannot be understood or listened to, or when we are cut off from literacy, from a capacity that others around us possess? One text that confronts the question of what it means to not have access to language is Octavia Butler's 1983 short story, Speech Sounds. The title of her story alone, a story that won her the Hugo Prize in 1984, signals that it will be about speaking, and yet through the title we already may sense something is cut short. Sounds are emphasized, making us wonder what kind of communication will take place. If we hear sounds, does this mean that we are indeed communicating? Does this mean a message has been understood or only heard without comprehension? 
In speech sounds, human beings are not able to communicate through language, and specifically, it is something that resembles an illness that swept over the world that is the cause of the state. Butler writes of the root of her character's predicament, quote, the illness, if it was an illness, had cut even the living off from one another. As it swept over the country, people hardly had time to lay blame on the Soviets. Sorry, I can't help but laughing. Though they were falling silent along with the rest of the world on a new virus, a new pollutant, radiation, divine retribution. The illness was stroke swift in the way it cut people down and stroke-like in some of its effects, but it was highly specific. Language was, almost, was always lost or severely impaired. It was never regained. Often there was also paralysis, intellectual impairment, death, end quote. In her narrative, the very cause of what makes language inaccessible to most human beings is in its very nature inaccessible. The narrative does not tell us what the possible illness even is and the characters themselves do not know. What is clear is the utter destruction and devastation that the world has undergone. <clears throat> we might be reminded here of Butler's status as an author who has an uncanny ability to foresee where we are in our current world. All that we learn about whatever has destroyed human interaction and speech sounds is that the source of the demise of human society, one that causes language to no longer be accessible is itself inaccessible or unreadable. It is made clear that people are cut off from one another. This is indeed what the story illustrates. Butler's dystopian world here asks us to think about the very nature of experience and language. Language is often discussed as that which never can fully capture our internal self or sensations. Um, I'm going to skip this. I was talking a little bit, I'll just say briefly, thinking about the, this concept um, in Lacanian theory about the missed encounter, this idea that we're often not able to understand one another, even in a, a less hyper-traumatized world, perhaps, than the one that we see in speech sounds, although we can certainly see connections in terms of how traumatized we are in our current society. Anyway, I'll keep going. Um, <clears throat> So here one could spend more time thinking about Butler's status as one who talks about race, racial oppressions and injustices um, with which Butler's writings are associated and which come up in speech sounds through the names of the only two named characters, Obsidian and Rye. Obsidian and Rye connoting the color of the character's skin. <clears throat> Nikita Gale in her essay, Afterwards on, on Octavia Butler's speech sounds, explores speech sounds as a text which considers the impacts of trauma on speech. Those who suffer trauma suffer too from the way trauma can lead to silence. Gail reminds us of Elaine Scarry's incredible work, The Body in Pain. <clears throat> I too, I just by chance before I read Nikita, Nikita Gail's article, I was also thinking about, I've thought often about Elaine Scarry when I read Butler's text. <clears throat> Butler's, Butler's story shows us how the experience of pain can limit language, and Ascari explores language is where pain gets stored. In speech sounds, everyone has suffered intense trauma. The main character, Rai, for example, lost all of her family, including all of her three children. Perhaps her silence stems also from simply this un, unfathomable loss. Okay. The story opens with interactions defined by powerlessness and helplessness. Quote, Two young men were involved in a disagreement of some kind or more likely a misunderstanding. They stood in the aisle grunting and gesturing at each other, each in his own uncertain T stance as the bus lurched over the potholes. The driver seemed to be putting some effort into keeping them off balance. Still their gestures stopped just short of contact. Mock punches, hand games of intimidation to replace lost curses. People watched the pair then looked at one another and made small anxious sounds. Two children whimpered. Rye sat a few feet behind the disputants and across from the back door. She watched, she watched the two carefully, knowing the fight would begin when someone's nerve broke or someone's hand slipped or someone came to the end of his limited ability to communicate. These things could happen any time. One of them happened as the bus hit an especially large pothole and one man, tall, thin, and sneering, was thrown into a shorter opponent. Instantly, the shorter man drove his left fist, left fist into the disintegrating sneer. He hammered his larger opponent as though he neither had had nor needed any weapon other than his left fist. He hit quickly enough, hard enough to batter his opponent down before the taller man could regain his balance or hit back even once. People screamed or squawked in fear. Those nearby scrambled to get out of the way. Three, three more young men roared in excitement and gestured wildly. Then somehow a second dispute broke out between two of these three, probably because one inadvertently touched or hit the other. 
As a second fight scattered frightened passengers, a woman shook the driver's shoulder and grunted as she gestured toward the fighting. The driver grunted back through bared teeth. Frightened, the woman drew away. Rye, knowing the methods of bus drivers, braced herself and held onto the crossbar of the seat in front of her. When the driver hit the brakes, she was ready and the combatants were not. They fell over seats and onto screaming passengers, creating even more confusion. At least one more fight started, end quote. The narrative opens with a view of human communication devoid of clarity and effectiveness. Instead, people are unable to convey anything beyond aggression, helplessness, fear. Human beings are reduced to simple reaction and are unable to understand one another. Aggression comes from misunderstanding and confusion. There is not a disagreement here if people cannot even understand enough to perhaps disagree, quote unquote, more likely a misunderstanding. Butler's description reminds us of other conflicts without understanding, sorry, reminds us of war and other conflicts without, under, without understanding, human beings often react through aggr aggression and defensiveness. Nikita Gale discusses how subjects are reduced to their bodies in Butler's text. Quote, communication has retreated to the visible body. That space between bodies formerly designated for speech and listening has been removed entirely. Language has been replaced by paroxysm and elaborate physical gestures that stop, quote, just short of contact. In this world, the body is the word and text by which meaning is produced and received, end quote. One of the only instances of connection or relating that does take place in the story is indeed through bodies. Rai and the stranger whom she encounters, Obsidian, have a sexual encounter, one that opens up a kind of return to life and relatedness for Rai. Joy even emerges through their experience. She giggles and, quote, could not remember the last time that she had giggled. Rai then asks Obsidian to go home with her, their connection initiating a desire for a future. For philosophers like Emmanuel Levinas and Jean-Luc Nancy, relating to the other always involves the possibility of wounding, exposure, pain. Butler's text set in a hyper-traumatized world asks us to consider ways that our, that our world is always already traversed by pain or wounding. In speech sounds, human relationships are almost exclusively wounded and take place in the non-identifiable non-identifiable world of pain and trauma. This is a topic that arises of ne in many of Butler's writings. The oppressed, excluded, and traumatized are often her protagonists. Butler's works are read as important responses, of course, to racial injustice and oppression, as well as acutely aware of imbalances of power and access. Here in Speech Sounds, Valerie Rye and Obsidian both have capacities that are more advanced than others around them. Significant in the text is that the protagonists and others become victims of persecution if their abilities or access to language become known. Obsidian, the bearded man whom we later find out as a policeman, is first encountered after the bus incident and like Rai is described as more capable than others. Quote, the bearded man stood still, made no sound, refused to, clear, refused to respond to clearly obscene gestures. The least impaired people tended to do this, stand back unless they were physically threatened and let those with less control scream and jump around. It was as though they felt it beneath them to be as touchy as the less comprehending, end quote. Later in the narrative, Rai faces her own intense reaction to the fact that Obsidian can read. His literacy is painful for her. She is one who was once both a teacher and writer. Quote, she had lost reading and writing. That was her most serious impairment and her most painful. She had taught history at UCLA. She had done freelance writing. Now she could not even read her own manuscripts. She had a house full of books that she could neither read nor bring herself to use as fuel. She, and she had a memory that, that would not bring to her much of what she had read before. He could read, she realized belatedly. He could probably write too. Abruptly, she hated him, deep, bitter hatred. What did literacy mean to him, a grown man who played cops and robbers? But he was literate and she was not. She would never be. She felt sick to her stomach with hatred, frustration, and jealousy. Butler creates a world in which those who possess a greater capacity for communication cannot, however, share their abilities. Differences between people lead to envy and aggression rather than the learning or sharing of knowledge. Speech sounds for me brings to mind characters or figures of helplessness and specifically those who cannot communicate their pain. For interest of time, I will not go into great detail about the story, but I will read the famous description of the suffering child in Ursula K. Le Guin's famous story, The One Who Walked Away From Omas. I'm just gonna ask you, how much time do I have left? I'm so sorry. Sorry, couldn't get my unmute on. <laughs> about, about five minutes, I Okay, think. great, okay, great, thanks. 
Um, so I'll just go ahead and read part of this quote um, of the suffering child in Ursula K. Le Guin's famous story, The Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas. This abject figure is also without speech and famously symbolizes exploitation in our capitalist modern society, among other things. It is a suffering child in Le Guin's story whose torture and helplessness is what allows the city of Omelas to flourish and for its citizens to live happily. And I'll just read part of the quote um, for interest of time. In a basement under one of the beautiful public buildings of Omelas, or perhaps in the cellar of one of its spacious private homes, there is a room. It has one locked door and no window. A little light seeps in dustily between cracks in the boards, secondhand from a cobwebbed window somewhere across the cellar. In the corner of the little room, a couple of mops with stiff clotted foul smelling heads stand near a rusty bucket. The floor is dirt, a little damp to the touch as cellar dirt usually is. In the room, a child is sitting. It could be a boy or a girl. It looks about six, but actually is nearly 10. It is feeble minded. Perhaps it was born defective or perhaps it has become imbecile through fear, malnutrition and neglect. It picks its nose and occasionally fumbles vaguely with its toes or genitals as it sits hunched in the corner far, farthest from the bucket and the two mops. It is afraid of the mops. It finds them horrible. It shuts its eyes, but it knows the mops are still standing there and the door is locked and nobody will come. The door is always locked and nobody ever comes except that sometimes the child has no understanding of time or interval. Sometimes the door rattles terribly and opens and a person or several people are there. One of them may come in and kick the child to make it stand up. The others never come close, but peer in at it with frightened, disgusted eyes. The food bowl and the water jug are hastily filled. The door is locked, the eyes disappear. The people at the door never say anything, but the child who has not always lived in the tool room and can remember sunlight and its mother's voice sometimes speaks. I will be good, it says, please let me out. I will be good. They never answer. The child used to scream for help at night and cry a good deal, but now it only makes a kind of whining uh, uh, and it speaks less and less often. It is so thin, there are no calves to its legs. Its belly protrudes. It lives on a half bowl of cornmeal and grease a day. It is naked. Its buttocks and thighs are a mess of festered sores as it sits in its own excrement continually, end quote. The description in the Gwyn story epitomizes absolute powerlessness and perhaps the child's utter abject state can be read as a very wound that trauma is or creates. The idea of trauma as, as wound is discussed by many theorists on trauma like Kathy Cruz and others. The tortured child's body is literally a mass of wounds and pain. In Le Guin's description and tied to the world in which Butler's characters and speech sounds live, the child is reduced to animal-like sounds. The human being's distinction as an animal with a higher capacity, the capacity to speak is recalled, yet here undone. Notably in many of Le Guin's texts, animals can actually speak like human beings. Cats are especially important in many of her works, including her own cat, Pard. Thus communication for Le Guin is often not reserved for human beings. And it perhaps ironically in Omelas, the treatment of the horse described in the beginning of the narrative shows that there is some ethical awareness. The, the treatment of the horse with kindness in the beginning of the narrative shows that there is some ethical awareness in Omelas. In the case of the child, most of Omelas city, citizens accept the child's torture as a necessary evil. The child can no longer relate through speech and most disturbingly, the language that it can use is not received. The child state in the story reminds us of how the most powerless, the ones most abused or exploited are often the ones who are voiceless or unheard. Again, like in Butler's speech sounds, pain brings silence, mirroring the impacts that trauma inflicts. The ending of the ones who walk away from Omelas, like the end of speech sounds is however hopeful. As the title suggests, there are those who choose to protest the mistreatment of the powerless child. They leave Omelas. They are the ones who walk away with a possibility that a new society might be created or located. Some, after seeing the state of the child, fall silent for a few days. Perhaps their own language breaks down in the face of the child's pain. These then, quote, leave Omelas, these people. They then leave Omelas. They walk ahead into the darkness and they do not come back. They, the place they go towards is a place even less imaginable to most of us in the city of happiness. I cannot describe it at all. It is possible that it does not exist but they seem to know where they're going, the ones who walk away from Omelas. This other possible world for which they leave is one that is enigmatic beyond understanding and beyond language. The narrator cannot describe this other space. The no place in the definition of utopia comes to mind as well as Le Guin's incorporation of Taoism. Taoism's focus on the unknowable or mysterious can be felt at the end of the ones who walk away. The story's title suggests that we should embrace the possibility of protest that we should hear the child's cry, 
even if this might lead to the unknown. Butler's short story similarly ends with the idea that another world might be possible. Many have noted the hope with which the story closes. Speech and understanding, understanding become possible at the closing of the text. After the trauma of Obsidian's death, Rye realizes that the two children whom she rescues after the death of their mother can speak. She takes their mother's body into her car along with Obsidian's. Quote, the, child began to, the children began to cry, but she knelt on the broken pavement and whispered to them. They were at time, if you can. Okay, I was just, all I was gonna, uh, I'll just end with the very last words of, her, of the short story. I'm sorry that I, I ran out, um, I was almost there. Quote, I'm Valerie Rye, she said, savoring the words. It's all right for you to talk to me, end quote. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Catherine? Hello there. Um, <clears throat> uh, as I was introduced, I am I am Catherine Pratt. I'm gonna uh, so share some slides, um, which I hope everybody can see, and um, and I hope they won't be deadly. Thank you very much for having me here, and I'm really I'm so honored and pleased to be uh, speaking with all of these other incredibly fascinating people. Um, so I'm, I'm talking about, I'll, I'm going to be talking about fan fiction today, which is uh, <clears throat> a sort of, uh, a much maligned um, and often justly maligned um, corner of the, of the science fiction, of the fiction universe. I mean, it's not all science fiction. Um, <clears throat> but where, whereas we've been talking mostly about um, how different communities and different modalities find access to science fiction. I'm, I actually wanna take a look at science fiction as a route of access to a community. Um, so, and I'm, so I'm gonna explore the fan fiction in particular, this the fan, fan fiction around this uh, one television show, Supergirl, uh, and the way, because it's been used in such an interesting way by queer women all over the world uh, to connect to each other and to express and develop the values of a community. Um, I, I discovered fan fiction myself only a few years ago and <clears throat> that's, I am, um, I guess, confessing my complete lack of cool and, uh, doing that, I'm quite, uh, that fan fiction has been around a long, long time and it's been um, uh, a big part of fan culture, particularly of um, science fiction media uh, for a long, long time. And it's it's not just fiction, I should say, it's also, the, you know, you see I have fan art in parentheses because it does include, of course, images and videos and podcasts and all kinds of things. But for the most part, it's just what it sounds like, you know, that fans of shows <clears throat> are creating art of various kinds, using the characters often, although not always, also the story and the settings of um, a particular, whatever, media property. Um, sometimes authors are just borrowing the characters to create entirely different worlds or, you know, uh, contemporary realistic worlds. Um, but in every case, uh, we're looking at um, the characters from something that already exists being used in stories that are new in some way. Much of it, maybe most of it, um, certainly in the popular imagination, um, most of it is romantic. You know, it centers on the relationships and often the development of relationships between characters from these other shows or movies. Um, and that's, you know, there's, it's a good, why that is true is kind of a good question. I guess it's not the main thing I'm gonna dwell on here. Um, I'm just, I'm gonna talk about 
what's happening, not why it's this particular thing is happening. <clears throat> um, so most fan fiction um, centers on a ship, and that is from relationship. Uh, you often, again, not always, but often um, an author is pairing characters who are not uh, romantically involved in the original show. Um, and it's, it's also become a verb, you know, to ship two characters it means just like imagine or um, uh, participate in the, you know, uh, fandom of uh, a particular set of characters. Um, and of course, every fan wants to rewrite aspects of um, the shows and movies and stories that they're um, enjoying. There's always, there's always something, you know, some plot point that should have gone differently or, you know, a, <clears throat> you know, a way something should have ended or, uh, a, a, an improbability in the science that needs to be fixed. Uh, what I'm interested in today is a very specific, um, a very specific uh, structure, creation of structure, um, which is um, uh, where in this particular community, there um, queer women, and I, I, I use the word women sort of loosely, and as shorthand, I mean, there are, um, uh, first of all, there's no way to know who everybody is, whether or not they are women or identify as women. Um, many authors and characters in are, are trans. Uh, <clears throat> So when I, which is why I think I'm gonna to prefer to use the term queer rather than, rather than lesbian, even though what I'm gonna be focusing on is um, these uh, uh, um, woman, woman relationships, female, female, FF is how the, uh, uh, how the genre uh, uh, abbreviates it. Um, in uh, in film slash oh slash is another term which I'm I won't dwell on but uh, this the whole genre actually I mean it's also like fascinating history but um, developed from largely from women heterosexual women rewriting uh, rewriting shows books movies whatever. Um, and pairing up the male characters. So slash refers to, referred specifically to, um, you know, the rewriting of, of, uh, of media to feature gay male relationships. And again, mostly written by heterosexual women, very strange, but um, there is also, there are people who write heterosexual romance. I'm, um, I'm interested in this, um, development of a whole community, of a whole, um, really a whole world of um, the lesbian pairings in Supergirl. Um, th and then and they're not just fixing plot twists, although sometimes they are doing that as well. Um, they're kind of reinventing the characters from like, you know, from the soul out, um, creating images of themselves. Um, and I just wanted to, let's, I wanted to look at you know, how does a ship work? Okay, well, you've got canonical characters in a show. So this is Janeway and Seven of Nine in Star Trek. Uh, which one was it? Voyager. You might even have some canonical in interaction of the characters, but for whatever reason, these seize the imagination of, um, women who want to see themselves, who want to experience uh, uh, lesbian characters in, in space. Uh, and so 
you know, sometimes there's a little photoshopping. Uh, if they're, if people are uh, more artistically talented and ambitious, even uh, creation from, from the ground up. Um, but I'm looking at, at, at and, and this, this pairing, of course, Star Trek Voyager has been off the air for years. People are still writing um, Janeway and Seven stories. And again, why Janeway and Seven? Why not Belana Torres? I don't, who knows? Um, it, not that there isn't Belana Torres fan fiction, but for, um, uh, again, that's a, a something you could explore for, uh, you know, why the particular characters are, are chosen to, you know, bear the mantle. Um, but so I'm gonna, but I want to look at written fan fiction, um, uh, being a writer and reader myself. And I'm going to look at, specifically, there's this um, uh, organization, um, location, website, archive, the archive of our own, I'll call it so called AO3. And it is full of fan created and posted um, literature. Um, you can see this was, I, I found this this, this morning um, from the stats from this morning, more than eight and a half million works. A lot of people are doing a lot of writing for their own enjoyment. Supergirl in particular, um, has has an extraordinary fan project among queer women. And there are other queer pairings that are, you know, that are important and that, uh, you know, get a lot of ink. Um, this one, I, I think, well, first of all, there is way too much to look at if you look at every show. So, but also Supergirl has some distinctive advantages as, um, as a focus. Well, first of all, there is like this super powerful uh, female character. Um, and it's, she is also supported by a cast, which is uh, largely and unusually uh, women. As, a, as the show itself, I, I, you know, it's the adventures of an orphaned and displaced Kryptonian who has a superhero identity and then also, you know, a mild mannered reporter, alter ego. In, in short, it's, um, it's fairly standard, right? I mean, it, it draws enormously from the comics, from Superman, um, from, it's, it's genre fiction. So, but it has created this vast trove of material, almost all of which, again, this is very unusual, almost all of which uh, concerns female-female relationships, uh, femme slash. Uh, and all of these are exploring these themes of, uh, of queer, identity, queer community. Uh, and maybe most interestingly, all of these stories, not all, but most of these stories, a core, an important core of these stories are in conversation with each other. And you can tell that as you read them because, you know, they use some of the same language, um, some of the same situations. Um, they focus on the same pairings, of course, not, and not just the, the main pairings, but there are also some, you know, a handful of you know, like improbable um, uh, couplings that get focused on uh, in many, many stories. Uh, is one beautiful example, there's a character uh, who is Lena Luthor's secretary in the Supergirl show. She has, to my, to my knowledge, one appearance in one show. 
in the entire six seasons of the show. Um, and she is a frequent uh, character appearing in Supergirl Found Slash. Why? Who knows? But it's just, it's so interesting. They borrow from each other the sense of the importance of this character. And it's one way in which you can see that they're all reading each other. It's one way that you can see, they're not telling the same stories, um, but they are mostly exploring the values and the themes and the identity of you know, being a queer woman in mostly in the US um, at this moment. And, you know, it is not just a question of plot. It's a question of um, <clears throat> relationships with family, um, being out at work, um, having children as a, 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 a female couple. Um, None of which, of course, is a well, which is addressed only tangentially in this show, um, but which creates like it, um, an entire archive of a culture, and not just the culture of, of the show, but of the queer culture that actually exists. Um, maybe the most fascinating. Um, piece of that is, although I, I'm sorry to say among the least readable, is <clears throat> the number of adolescents who are writing and reading these stories. And you can tell that they are learning. They're learning about living in the world as, uh, as lesbians or non-binary or queer kids. They're even learning about sex. There's a, <laughs> there's a real aspect of sex ed. Um, in some of these stories. And there are lots of reasons why. Warning, Catherine. Okay, sorry. Um, <clears throat> one of the reasons that Supergirl is, is this, uh, is the sort of perfect sandbox is that there is a central character who is a lesbian. This is Supergirl's sister. She turns out to be a lesbian. She has a relationship, which becomes very important in fan culture. Um, that relationship ends after the third season. Meanwhile, we also the show also introduces the sister of Lex Luthor, who is rebranding the a Luther Corporation. Um, she uh, becomes friendly with Supergirl, both as her alter ego and as her super self. Uh, and this, interestingly, this is the relationship that the fans create. Now, now there's the, the relationship that the, that the show has given us and everything, you know, then that's pretty awesome. Um, but it wasn't enough, right? This is the, this is the uh, pairing that the fans are most invested in. Again, um, 6,000 works for Maggie Sawyer, 17 plus for Supergirl and uh, her Luther. All right, I'm gonna have to stop you there, Catherine, sorry. We're That's over time. Fine. I understand. But so Very interesting. Much. I'm yeah. sure people will have plenty of questions in the Q&A section. Mm -hmm. uh, Sean, you're up. I hope everybody can hear me. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, great. Let me uh, let me share my screen and hopefully I share it in the right way that I'd like to share it. All right. Can you guys see um, my slideshow? Yeah, thank you. Okay. <clears throat> it's very nice to meet everybody. Thank you uh, very much for organi organizing this once again, Jason, and thank you, Joy, and everybody here in the panel. Uh, so my concern today is um, cool access and access to cool. A slight change of the title. Um, I do want to talk about Dorothea Benedetti, but basically I'm talking about Case Pollard and Dorothea, the two main characters in um, Gibson's pattern recognition. So let me see if I can get my slides to work. Good. 
My brief paper explores representations of cool, especially the types of cool available to certain female characters in Gibson's pattern recognition. The project started when I noticed an increasing presence of female protagonists in Gibson's recent works, especially Case Pollard in Pattern Recognition, Hollis Henry in Spook Country and Zero History, Major Guadalupe Torres and Naomi Givens in Archangel, Flynn Fisher in The Peripheral, and Verity Jane's Verity Jane and the superpowered AI assistant Eunice in his most recent novel, Agency. And my goal, actually, this was going to be a paper just about Archangel until I got started and I had to formulate this idea of cool. And then I just went back to kind of some of the, the books I knew better. And so I'm with pattern recognition. This is the beginning of this kind of study. So um, I look forward to reading lists and all kinds of advice. Two, th two things. Um, uh, or actually, I already mentioned Archangel was my, my goal. But the other thing is, I'm not necessarily concerned with the look of cool, even though cool is very much part of pattern recognition because the lead character is a cool hunter. But I'm really interested in the technique of cool, and I hope by the time I finish and I can talk about Slack cool and network cool, that will all make sense. Also, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of what SF can do for access to cool. Um, so I'm borrowing from Kay Mitchell's um, Bodies That Matter, Science Fiction, Technoculture, and the Gendered Body. I follow her statement especially that SF is one of the discourses that can re help to reformulate the social and cultural meanings of the gendered body in the technological age, as well as imaginatively refashioning its very forms, molding its matter, as it were, in some hypothesized future world. SF then has the power to reveal reformulations of who can be cool and new types of cool. So I want to unpack the idea and a little bit of the history of cool. Cool is sutured into U.S. culture specifically. It is not timeless. It's not a concept that can apply to everyone or anything anywhere. It is specific to art practice practices, especially music, film, and literature. The core principles of the idea of cool according to Leon Dinerstein. Yes, and this is a kind of a mid-century, kind of 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, cool. According to Dinerstein, he says that it's a public mode of covert resistance that arrives from highly personal resources. It is a certain look of tough, toughness and self-mastery, a blank facial expression and a corresponding economy of motion. And this idea of cool has kind of, it has evolved. and. It first started with this kind of um, very British ideal of class-based stoic dignity, kind of Sherlock Holmes cool. Then it transformed into kind of a gumshoe noir cool in the films of the 30s and 40s. Most interesting for me though is this evolution um, of how ideas of cool were regenerated and reused in, um, in jazz. African-American jazz artists, especially of the 30s, were using the term cool increasingly in many ways, in lyrics to describe each other and to describe techniques of playing their instruments or singing. It was to convey a calm cerebral space of relaxation. So key examples are Lester Young and Billie Holiday. These two jazz and blues artists can be considered to have invented Cool 1.0. Of course, you can debate about this, but that's, that's where I'm coming from because what they do more than the gumshoes or more than Sherlock Holmes is they are creating a cool that is based on a survival strategy. Black artists had to walk a tightrope in terms of racial violence and oppression and also create and maintain a stage persona. This cool was then technique and philosophy. Bell Hooks writing about a parallel idea of cool, calls this older mid-century cool taking pain and using a sort of alchemy to turn it into gold. But the trick is to withstand the heat of the process and stay centered. Billie Holiday fought and drank just like male musicians, often left clubs with women or men, smoked hash in cabs driving around New York. Now that we know more, we would say are cool. But at the time, she was not considered in the same company as Miles Davis and Lester Young. Why? Well, the unfortunate answer is stories we've heard too often. 
the people writing about jazz and blues, the academics, the media, were focused more on the male musicians, and the people doing the writing were more often men than women. So those unfortunate are these pieces of, of the puzzle of why it took more work to re recognize Billie Holiday and many others as cool, Bessie Smith and many, many other jazz and blues artists. Um, another reason is that the cultural ethos of the, at the time had a hard time kind of corroborating a female caretaker with a rude autonomy and this agency of cool of being the lone, like the lone gun. However, women always were able to access this cool and they still do, but it's just how do we pay attention to them? How do we represent these cool notions of cool? So now I'm going to leap radically into the future from this mid-century blues and jazz cool to talk about Alan Liu's Laws of Cool from 2004. His ideas can help us bring mid-century cool into the digital age by reinterpreting cool's emphasis on resistance and how information is used. So Billy's, Billy Holiday's Blues and Jazz Cool was clearly resisting not only the music business, not only audiences, not only the male gaze, but and not only just racism that she faced daily. Uh, she was doing all these things, but in a similar way, how can we talk about cool in the office cubicle in the skyscraper? Well, if we think about, well, who is in the office cubicle? Who is a knowledge worker? There are millions who are doing it, and they're often under some kind of pressure due to status, education, gender, and race. So these post-industrial industries do replicate the music industry of the 1950s and 40s. According to Liu here, the interchangeable modular office with its cold fluorescent lighting and muted grays and browns, the idea is cool, of cool is not the cool of counterculture cool or subculture cool, not punk or goth or techno cool, but rather I'm cool, I'm wired. He says in, in a sense, people are cool because they're wired. This sort of cool is a technique. This sort of cool uses information to resist other types of information. Cool is a method of, for negotiating identity in postmodern, post-industrial networks of information and power. So let's get back into pattern recognition. We follow Case Pollard, a freelance marketing professional, a cool hunter hired by the Belgian Hubertus Bijan, but I like to call him Big End. And he wants her, Case, to find out the maker of a bunch of film fragments called footage. And the footage has kind of captivated the entire world. And everybody wants to know who's doing it, who's making it, but nobody actually knows. Big End wants Case to find out because of her abilities to uh, have allergies to um, marketing techniques. And marketing, fashion, and business form the entire social backdrop of the novel so that artists are now hustlers trying to fund their next gigs by taking on small stealth marketing jobs. Case's objective, though, is to find the maker, and with Big End paying, it seems like she can do it. Um, if you, and this is, this is from page two of the book, Google case and you will find cool hunter. And if you look closely, you may see it suggested she is a sensitive of some kind, a dowser in the world of marketing. Whoops. Sorry. Though in truth, Damien, her old boyfriend would say is closer to an allergy, a morbid and sometimes violent reactivity to the semiotics of the marketplace. Uh, so it's interesting that the cool hunter has an allergy to certain looks of cool and that she is invested in the look of cool. But I want to talk about her technique of finding things. Her main challenger is Dorothea Benedetti, an Italian marketing pro who not only wants to find the maker as well, she wants Case's job. Um, what drives both of them to find this footage and the maker? And what's interesting is this footage is not necessarily a, whoops, the footage is not necessarily a, um, a, a known thing. It's a very blurry, pixelated bunch of film clips that we have no idea who the actors are. We have no idea who the maker is. We don't know the purpose. We don't know the narrative structure of it. And these secrets are part of what makes it cool. 
All right, so um, here are some kind of visual representations of case and what might be Dortia. So this artist, Gerald Perel, has created what may look like case using the, her very clear fashion kind of icons of Levi's and her, her Buzz Rickson's jacket. This over here is actually an interpretation of Prada 2002, and Dor Dortia Benedetti loves Prada, and she wears it all the time. It's very clearly described, and so I just wanted to say that, like, in, in some ways, they kind of look similar, but these are, you know, there's not been a film made of this novel, so it's very highly interpreted visuals of these two characters. But again, even though fashion is super important to this novel, and they're all cool hunters, it's technique that makes them cool, I think. So I want to talk about this idea of slack, because this is where Leo really helps me understand the idea of cool. He says, the idea of slack imagined a situation in which two characters act like two weights connected by a slack string. The sound and timing and gestures inside the interval when the second weight does not move at all, and then a sudden jerk as it starts in motion, and a simultaneously a retrograde jerk on the first weight that creates the cross rhythms perhaps even standing waves in the connecting string. The string, as it were, sings when they can the weight and then they move. It's not jazz, but the cross rhythms are a kind of cool that I want to, by this elaborate metaphor, talk about. Here's a, a gif that I made of these two weights pulling a string around. You can see they go all over the place. It's a very kind of creative process. Okay, enough of that. Um, so the initiating wake, weight in this slack technique, and I have on the on this left side here, Case Pollard, on the right side, Dorotea. The initiating weight is the post-industrial progress of Blue Ant, a globally distributed high-speed, low-drag ad agency. It's extremely well-funded, and it relies on, the key here is it relies on trusting the cool hunter, Case, to be left alone unsupervised. The following weight, Case, um, Case Pollard. So once Case is jerked back, or jerks back on Blue Ant, this agency has many choices to make, but what they do is they basically let her free associate. They let, let Case Pollard seek, take risks, and wander. These are, this is what Case says in her email to the maker when she eventually finds the maker of the footage. Case then is constantly buffered from oversight and then can work creatively, associationally, and writerly. In a sense, she is an artist. She is able to move freely to take the slack time, the slack distances, and move in a different way than Dorotea does, which makes their cool different. So the initiating weight for Dorotea is a modern industrial Baltic Russian oil slash mafia, and they rely on hierarchy codes, money, and threats as motivating forces. So Dorotea, once she jerks back on her employers, they just, in, they just per, give her more pressure to do her job, to fulfill the contract. It's a very linear contract. So Dorotea is really the archaic detective. She's not writerly. In fact, she pays a grad student to write for her, and she is violent first, silent second. She's less jazz, more cool noir, but not even really a successful gumshoe. And I have a problem with that because Dorothea should be awesome and cooler, but we never get an interior narrated. We never get focalization through her. We get all the focalization through Case. Um, okay, how am, I, am I do, how am I doing for time? Do I have any time left? A couple minutes maybe? One minute? I have about a minute. Yes, okay. Um, so at the end, Case does meet the maker and Dorothea meets Case meeting the maker and Dorothea tries to kill her, but she survives, Case survives, because she had, as the writer, set up all these, um, all these emails to other people letting them know what's happening. And so in the end, they actually save her. Um, Case is networked cool, and I appreciate she doesn't turn simply into James Bond. Her artistry is subtle, and it's tethered to real workplace issues in the freelance, ad hoc, precarious world of contract work. She, she continues to develop and move according to the slack method, always using the energy from discordant vibrations between relationships. Um, she comes, comes back in the last novel, in Zero History, and what is she doing? She's no longer in marketing. She has created her own brand of genes. Thank you very much for listening. Please send uh, suggestions or criticisms 
Thanks. Great. Ida, go ahead. You're on mute. Ida, you're on mute. Yeah. Can you, uh, can I share a screen? Do I need to do anything for that? You should be able to at the bottom. Okay. At the bottom. Um, bottom middle okay. share screen. Okay. Got it. Great. Um, hold on. Let me. I'm looking at where my PowerPoint would be. Okay. Uh, is that working? Let me go to my, let me go to my PowerPoint and see. Whoops. Nope. Oh, uh, sorry. Have your PowerPoint open on the, the browser uh, on your yeah, screen, I, right? I mean, I have it, I have it on the screen, but let me, let me try to see if it, it works. Can you see that? We can't see it yet. Okay. I think you you hit the share screen button and then you should choose the PowerPoint in okay, hold window. On. Sorry. Um, okay, so I'm hitting share screen, um, asking it to play PowerPoint, but it's, it wants Zoom to share my screen to allow system preferences. Um, you know, I'm just gonna. I think I'm just gonna talk this through. I think that might be that might be easier also because I th I think we're sort of running short on time. Okay, um, so my title is Corporate Employment Practices Towards Greater Diversity of Story Development for SFF um, Screen Stories. Uh, I'm gonna break this talk down to two different um, aspects. One is corporations internally um, at the workplace level. And secondly, it'll be corporate corporations facing communities. So um, going outside of their organizational structures um, towards communities. I wanna begin with a set of internal workplace changes that have been suggested uh, might help diversity and inclusion factors, not only for SFF type texts, but all mass media scripted texts in general. Um, I'm gonna evaluate each of these and then I'm going to move and we, you know, which are efforts going on in injury industry and corporations right now. And then I'm gonna to go towards um, corporations and how they deal with uh, communities in general. So first internal workplace changes. Um, many of you might've heard about inclusion riders. Uh, Frances McDormand very famously in her 2018 Academy Award actress, uh, best actress, um, winning speech uh, mentioned an inclusion writer, i.e. Uh, producers, directors, and stars who have power in Hollywood basically uh, specify that uh, as part of their contract, they want X percentage of African-American um, workers or Y percentage of casting that is Asian. Um, this effort currently, um, so that, that mention was in 2018 and everybody went and looked up how to do this. Um, this effort itself is sort of dead in the water right now. Uh, Frances McDormand more famous, uh, uh, more recently uh, basically said, I don't know what I was thinking and I hadn't researched it properly. So that's sort of the, the bad news. These, these diversity trends are only as, as powerful uh, as the trends last. Um, but in that time, uh, actors like Michael P. Jordan have actually used the inclusion rider. So even if it was dead, it helped promote consciousness about diversity. Uh, and the result of that and other efforts is that industry itself today is changing towards casting diversity such that it's approaching parity, at least in terms of lead actors um, in a lot of um, not only science fiction fantasy narratives, but other genre narratives. Another effort that um, producers and production companies can do is hiring benchmarks. Uh, Ryan Murphy, who's a horror maven, um, especially in television and streaming, had a half initiative. Basically, he said that um, all the um, staff of his TV shows, and this includes American Horror Story, American Crime Story, Story at um, Hollywood, et cetera, um, of all of those staff, at least half should be women and or people of color. The problem with this type of effort is it relies on the individual producer, not the studio, not the network, not the company, or even the industry. Um, diversity and recru diversity recruitment and training programs as uh, something that has been going on in Hollywood for 30 years and produced largely dramatic 
and comedic writers. So not necessarily, and directors, not necessarily science fiction fantasy writers and directors, uh, because uh, people of color women tend to not get the higher budget types of projects, but has produced people like, for example, Disney's diversity program is probably the first in the industry going back to 1990, um, produced um, super producers like Shonda Rhimes, known for things like Scandal and Grey's Anatomy. Um, and it's only now, uh, 20, 30 years later, starting to produce SFF shows. So, um, you know, that kind of shows how backwards um, it is, but also how these programs do make a difference. Um, uh, Shonda Rhimes is, of course, both African-American and female. Um, there are also efforts um, post Me Too to lower institutional sexism and racism and related violence. These efforts today are going through backlash. For example, Time's Up, the organization that follows in the heels of Me Too to prevent especially sexism and misogyny in the Hollywood workplace is basically over. It went through a series of scandals. I can talk more about that um, over the past few years and now has almost no credibility. Uh, but the thing is, this is also being tested in the courts and it's been tested in the media. So this is not um, these types of um, post Me Too changes, um, whether more towards more the conservative side where we have powerful writers and uh, sorry, directors and starts um, trying to get uncanceled and appealing court decisions um, that had them seen as criminals and rapists and molesters. Um, but these decisions have not been um, fully you know, registered yet. We're right in the midst of that um, post Me Too. Uh, finally, within internal corporate workplaces, we have non-majority workers um, forming their own professional groups. So like Disney in the last five to seven years, and I am a Disney scholar, uh, tried has been trying to recruit indigenous screenwriters, um, especially post things like post projects like Frozen, where it made an effort um, to start a Sami, so indigenous Scandinavian, um, you know, writer recruitment program. Um, but often, even though the recruitment tools are there, um, the promotion and career ladder um, strategies are not, they're still oriented towards white men. Um, so we're finding that these groups are creating their own professional um, network. So an indigenous employee work group has been created among Disney native um, creatives. And that I can almost guarantee you that was not Disney management's idea, but it came from the workers themselves. Themselves. Uh, so these are examples of tools that are used today towards diversity in mass media SFF production. I want to talk also about corporations as they face community. So not internally, but also how do they deal with, with ethnic um, LGBTQ and marginalized communities and make some recommendations on steps that are maybe one or two steps ahead of what's actually be going on. So here are my recommendations. Uh, first of all, uh, companies need to work through, uh, work towards ending exploitative um, uh, it's cultural story trust and cultural advising. This is an old Hollywood tradition. Um, I'm focusing on Disney's recent use of this, but this goes back to, um, you know, uh, probably the 1920s or so, uh, where Hollywood to justify itself uh, telling minority stories. And um, we found this with Sound of the South, um, gets people from the cu cultural communities and tries to um, get their approval. Uh, more recently in movies like Moana, and this has been happening for maybe seven to 10 years, uh, Disney, for instance, has created story trusts. And the story trusts are not full-time employees, but they're actual people from marginalized communities who are hired just for a couple thousand dollars over um, in one shot. So it's a contract job that's very short term and asked uh, to basically meet over and over again over months and years during story production. Um, to give their cultural input. Um, we need to move away from cultural story trust. If you look at um, the credits of not just Moana, uh, but Frozen 2, um, Soul, et cetera, et cetera, there's a cultural story trust buried deep in there. And whether it's African-Americans, um, Sami people, Pacific Islanders, um, these are not people who are full-time or salaried. They're not credited writers, producers, production designers, animators, et cetera, but they're people whose cultures have been basically extracted and exploitative, and then brought out to become pro, um, corporate product. So ending the, 
story trust, um, ending the cultural advisement and actually hiring people full time um, for longer term um, employment and fair employment. Because once you're relatively full time, you have due process, you have certain types of rights, especially towards intellectual property. Um, and that's that would be my next recommendation, work towards full community intellectual property ownership. Um, corporate fantasy and science fiction um, you know, um, conglomerates such as Disney um, tend to do that type of labor extraction from cultural communities. And then what they do is they kind of homogenize the cultures and rebrand them under their corporate names. And we've seen that with Disney trying to, um, you know, take the term Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead, and put it under its intellectual property regime. Um, that was a really famous one. People don't know that under under Lilo and Stitch in Hawaii, it tried to do the same thing with the term Ohana um, and has an Ohana line of jewelry and, and um, you know, other types of lifestyle goods. Uh, so, so this is not good. Um, we want not just the, the cultural properties, which Disney has very um, proudly said, oh no, the cultural properties still belong to you. We'll just do our corporate thing, but also their, deriv their derivatives, um, their derivations um, should go towards some kind of community intellectual property. Um, all right, then two more, two more um, recommendations that I have. We need to be able to distinguish between real corporate support of communities versus spin and company branding. And in this age where diversity is a watchword, um, this kind of critical thinking is super essential. What's an example of spin? Spin would be when Mari, indigenous Mari Taika Waititi, who today is getting all kinds of notice as a writer director of television and film, was paraded out by Disney Corporation as one of the early writers of Moana um, to legitimize the project. However, his actual contributions were not used in the, the real story development of the film. So he's not given credit as a writer. Um, all the writers credited for that film are white. Most of them are male, you know. So that's, that's corporate branding or spin. We have to be very suspicious of these efforts because we know companies are using them, media companies are using them today. What would be a real contribution of, of, of corporations towards um, especially mass media fantasy and folklore production would be would be things like, for example, um, in Aulani Hotel that Disney has in West Oahu Island, Hawaii, um, Disney could, for example, repatriate all the native Hawaiian art that it bought in order to justify its so-called knowledge um, of Hawaiian folklore and legend and tradition. It's the largest collection of indigenous Hawaiian art in the world um, bought for the tourist hotel. They could repatriate it back to Native Hawaiians and the various Native Hawaiian independent sovereignty groups, right? So that would be something substantial. We need to be able to distinguish between um, spin versus real actions to support community. Finally, um, we can try to systematize um, individual efforts towards mentorship by majority producers and writers and directors um, towards minority creatives and storytellers. And we know that this, these efforts have been going on for decades. And in my other research, I basically show these mentorships in individual industry workplaces of white, basically white men um, who may be straight or may be gay, supporting women, supporting men of color, supporting indigenous writers and directors and kind of bringing them through basically a hostile workplace to tell diverse SFF stories. More recently, we can think of examples of Sam Mendes, who's straight and British and white, who supported Irish American gay writer, director John Logan in creating City um, Penny Dreadful. And John Logan, in turn, supported Fijian indigenous director, Pacific Islander director Tua Fraser in hiring him. So it's actually a chain, right? Somebody creates a workplace practice of mentorship of diversity, and then that tends to pay off in the long run. We need to systematize this in the workplace, these types of mentorships. Another example is Michael Schur, who created The Good Place, um, supporting Cord Jefferson, um, who's an African-American journalist um, who had done a little bit of work on Black late night TV as a writer, but Schur brought him into The Good Place, which is a fantasy show. And next thing you know, Cord Jefferson, who hadn't had any scripted television writing experience, is writing things like Lovecraft Country, where he's really well-known um, 
uh, for doing some African American historical story art. So this is um, how it's done. In general, um, I want to talk about um, concluding that techno cultural science fiction and fantasy genre modes are more important for us to study than full texts that are officially market labeled as science fiction and fantasy. So instead of things like um, Once Upon a Time and The Expanse, etc., we need to look at gender, LGBTQ, and cultural storytelling and television. So the example I have is Atlanta which is seen as a comedy or a surrealistic um, cable TV show um, starring Donald Glover. Um, and, you know, that wouldn't be labeled as, as fantasy but it or science fiction, but it has a lot of science fiction fantasy cognitively estranging modes. So let's look for those modes, um, pay, paying attention to minority produced and women produced and queer produced show, because they import spirituality and ethics from community world's views into their narrative. And we're not calling them SFF, we're calling them comedies or dramas or whatever, or um, procedurals. So we need to do that. And the other thing for access in science fiction uh, fantasy storytelling on television is to rethink um, our recruitment and training efforts in terms of educational credentials. The entry level educational credential for more most writer's assistant or director's assistant jobs is an MFA degree. Not everyone can afford a graduate film program, especially uh, those of us from minority communities whose parents want us to major in engineering or business or law or you know medicine or et cetera, et cetera. Um, so one of the efforts I'm interested in is having MFA, pro, um, basically MFA programs at vocational technical schools, at community colleges, right? Um, because screenwriting doesn't really need a master's degree. People are natural storytellers, especially those from cultural communities, and they're more than able, in my experience, um, to tell screen stories, but they're not allowed that because they can't do the graduate degree at a dedicated film program. So these are um, some things that I've been thinking about. Um, I'm going to put into the chat a couple of um, resources if you want to look at the statistics, which, by the way, are getting better on diversity in Hollywood. Um, so very glad to know that. And I think I'm done that we can we can start our uh, we can start. I definitely want to start the Q&A because we're running just maybe two minutes behind. I just want to make sure we at least have a few minutes to take questions if people have uh, questions. If you have a question, please put it in the uh, Q&A section at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you have a comment, you can put it in the chat, uh, but I'll monitor both. I don't see any yet. Um, so I figured I'd start off with a question and uh, probably mostly for, for Ida and Catherine here, but you know, one of the things that I noticed when I was researching online space online spaces that were inclusive for you know uh science fiction and fantasy creators of color or lgbtqia creators is you know these can be great spaces they can be very uh you know havens you know for these groups of people to be able to communicate with each other uh, and find each other but they can also be sort of pointed to as well look how far we've come look at all these different spaces that we have uh, without really putting the money and the time and the funding into, as you were saying, Ida, you know, bringing those people up to a higher, higher level of inclusion. So I'm wondering how you're both uh, thinking about these sort of like grassroots movements and fan movements. You know, can we move from that higher up or, or, is, or is this a top down issue? Either one of you can I'm take. Catherine. Well, I think. I mean, I think that's a great question. It's one of the one of the things that I always think of when I look at this enormous output of um, of creativity that is utterly unpaid and usually also anonymous. Uh, and there are so there are writers. I mean, as I said, and as you know, you would expect, most of it's pretty bad. <laughs> um, some of it's readable and but there are you know there are a few uh writers out there who are really quite good and who for whatever reason are not doing original work um and some of those reasons are um you know time and money and um 
and connections or lack thereof. Um, uh, and you know, there are times when I've written to people saying, you know, <laughs> it's basically what what are you what are you doing here? <laughs> you know, you should you should be writing uh, you should be writing novels. You should be uh, writing screenplays, and and the answer usually is, oh, just I just don't have time to do that. I, you know, I have two jobs. I have a kid. I whatever. It's a luxury. Yeah, and now there are some authors who have come out of fan fiction. Um, uh, the Shades of Grey woman, whatever her name is. Um, it, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, she's sort of the most famous example, but um, she's not the only one. Um, but that also requires, it just requires an enormous investment. Um, and I, I don't know where that comes from, really. I think um, I I agree. It, it's partly in the investment, and it's also that um, I mean I I hope you you all got my point about me too and ties up. So Hollywood is basically a hostile workplace, and that cultural practice has gone on since the beginning of Hollywood. The minute it became a big money making scheme, um, you know, as traditions of abuse, of exploitation, of workplace violence that are off the charts and only. Um, outdone by the music industry. So those of you in music, you can sort of share stuff there. Um, and so as women and people of color start to enter Hollywood, uh, it's no accident that Me Too got, um, you know, came up. And so right now they're trying to test some of the early cases of famous, you know, directors and producers and stars um, who exploited other workers. So we're in the testing case. Um, there was a movement, then there was backlash, and now it's being tested partly in the courts. But where fans make a difference is they have opinions and they're very loud about them, as I'm sure Catherine will tell you. So they'll say, we don't like this white guy raping all these women, right? Um, or the writers now, especially women and people see and trans and non-binary writers have spoken out from writers' rooms saying, this is a hostile environment. I was the only black writer. I was the only trans writer. Um, in the case of Janet Mock, um, if you've seen Pose by Ryan Murphy um, and Stephen Cannells, right? Pose is a, 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 a queer slash trans drama, but it has very strong fantasy mode. So I'm very interested in Pose, even though it's, it's, you know, it's not seen, there's no elves, there's no, you know, magic per se. It has very strong strong fantasy sub motifs um, around the, the, the ball uh, culture of 1970s and 80s and 90s New York City, right? Uh, but but Janet Mock, who came up as um, one of the few trans writers in the industry at her time, who's black, working class and trans, um, recently and, and was promoted through the ranks and, and taught to write and, and direct, um, recently called out Netflix. She got a deal because of that through Netflix um, and FXS for pay, underpaying her. And Ryan Murphy, who's the white cis but gay showrunner who promoted her, basically supported her. She called them out in a very public, you know, so these things are good. They're painful for the individual minority workers. Um, so, you know, I think we can guess that her next Netflix deal might be pretty much over, right? But every one of these speaking out um, expands the field a little more makes it less okay for people to be exploitative. Um, but the other thing is really, let's let's rethink the MFA as a minimum qualification for Hollywood um, directing and writing entry level work. I think that's BS. You don't need a master's degree to tell a story. Honestly, it's not that hard to write a screenplay, right? Especially for good storytellers. So anyway. And, and I would like to point out before, Lee, before uh, you make your comment that even spaces that that say they're inclusive like netflix right not only do we know now that they're having issues with these things but then look at you know examples like lovecraft country which was discontinued it was highly popular yes. Yes. you know so e even sometimes like you were saying ida this culture mining will mine it you know for one season because it's useful and it brings in you know new people to our platform but then we won't keep supporting it yeah absolutely lee you had a comment yeah, I was just going to say um, thank you. Um, I was actually thinking it just came to mind, Michaela Cole, right, who who wrote, who's this incredible writer who wrote You Destroy Me, wrote a lot about, um, you know, and she, I mean, was just completely ignored at all. You know, a lot of people were talking about that. But I was also thinking, just listening to, to everyone here about, and thinking about my students, right, and 
going back to, I had a student several years ago who sent me, was in a composition class and he sent me his, his science fiction novel. And, and I don't know what, I am not in touch with him right now, but I'm just thinking about, you know, how can we, and you brought this up, Ida, of course, but you know, how can we have this connection between, you know, to, between college programs, between, you know, how do we support students and have their voices be heard because it's true, right? If, if a student is writing in their composition class, wants to be a writer, they don't have access, you know, it's all about access. How do they gain access to, how will their voices, you know, ever be heard? Let's say, by, how are they gonna have the contact with the, uh, you know, how, that's just not, you know, so how do we even, I think the entering those spaces is, is, is barred for so many people, you know, and this is one of the things, of course, that you're talking about, but I just happen to be thinking a lot about, and my, so many of my students who, who really their favorite, writers and, 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 and modes of thinking, whether, you know, in, in text, film, et cetera, um, you know, they are people in these fan groups, right, creating these, these, this art, um, and a lot of them, you know, doing incredible anime, et cetera. How do we get them, their work seen? I mean, that's a, that's really, this is a question, of course. Yeah. And thank, yeah. You. thank you. Jason, do we have to stop or do we have time for one more question? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, maybe a quick question. Okay, because I don't I don't want to leave anyone out. <laughs> uh, you know, I just wanted to say, you know, Lee and Sean, how much I enjoyed your presentations, and and I can see sort of a link connect between those two presentations in the idea of of you know sound as communication versus not having sound as you know not being able to communicate, not being able to make sound. But I'm wondering how you both, because the theme of this conference is accessibility. Uh, how you both think about your projects in terms of, you know, uh, disability, you know, not everybody can speak, not everybody can hear. So where does that fit into your projects? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. Um, sorry if I was a bit quiet during my presentation. So where I would like to take my my work is that uh, Nora is one of the filmmake the filmmakers of the footage and she is uh, severely disabled because of a bomb her parents were assassinated in a bomb um, attempt to you know, to they, they were kind of, the parents were very wealthy and they wanted to take them out. And Stella and Nora survived, the two twins who end up being the footage makers. So how do they have access to be able to make the footage is through the uncle supports them with his extreme wealth, which was in one sense, it's like a move forward and a move back because they are given the um, uh, means and an extraordinary means like they have hundreds of people working for them to develop the footage but who is the overarching person the owner is this massively rich oligarch white male and that was kind of frustrating um, but I would like to pursue that because there's I think a lot of interest there because there is some communication between Nora who actually cannot talk through gesture she she's able to communicate with case um, and there's some tears and some very interesting affective moments there. And I also would like to get into Archangel, which Torres, the major Guadalupe Torres, is um, an injured um, a Marine, I believe. I think she's a Marine, injured Marine who is um, in a wheelchair. And she is one of the sole directors of trying to basically save the world. And she is successful with great cost. So I do want to eventually go into those areas of representation. And Lee, I really liked your paper because it's, you know, the, the notion of the gesture. Uh, for me, you know, talking about cool is in gestures. So here, like there is no speech, cool and not cool, violence and peace is through motion, gestures, affective space. Wow, I could just, I could just see my yeah. paper now becoming a whole book. I'm like, ah, I can't do it. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. I mean, can <laughs> yeah, no, it's I, I the, yeah, and thank you, Joy, for that question. And I was just also thinking about, you know, I'm also interested in. I didn't talk about this, and, I, and this is something that I would, you know, would be my next leap. No pun intended, because I'm also interested in dance and um, have a dance background. But I think, you know, what's interesting is to think about how can we go beyond what we understand, you know, as sort of typical communication. How so that we can, you know, not just define. And this is why I'm also really fascinated by 
um, you know, so the body, at, you know, movement. So there's so many places one could go, but of course jazz. And, and by the way, Sean, I was thinking about, I couldn't help but think about, sorry to take us in a different direction, but I was just thinking about slacking and the film slackers. I don't remember the details, but I had to sort of think about that and kind of this idea of slowness. And then it took me back into, into jazz and movement. But I, but I, you know, I really want to think about what you're asking, Joy, and take that seriously, because I think, you know, one of the things that a text like um, Speech Sounds that, you know, asks us to consider is what do we even mean by communication and why are we, you know, so focused on, on, on sound and hearing when we know that there are other, um, yeah, uh, that there are so many other forms and that the body can be, for example, you know, in, 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 her, in her text, the, the body becomes unreadable, but what are the ways that we can have, I mean, I do believe that of course the body can be legible and that, that, that there are of course many other modalities of communication. So, um, you know, there's, there's so much to say, but I'll, I'll just leave it there for now, but thank you. I think that puts us out of time, uh, but thank you guys to the presenters so much. I really super enjoyed all of those presentations, learned so much. Uh, so I'm very happy that I volunteered to, to moderate and sit in. And I wanna thank Jason and everybody at, at City Tech again for organizing this. Uh, you know, as somebody who's faculty at a community college, I don't get a lot of access sometimes. Uh, and I've been able to attend so many fantastic online conferences and symposiums, uh, which is probably the only bright spot of this last year. <laughs> so thank you guys for making this, this possible for us. And thank you, Joy, for moderating. And definitely check out uh, Joy's book, Diverse Futures. You can see it there in the background. <laughs>